This is Otaku Station, broadcasting anime analysis to anyone who will listen. We have a basement archive full of an ever-growing collection of anime media. We dig deep into the great anime of the past to give you the context you need to fully appreciate the best this medium has to offer. Let's jam. Welcome to the broadcast. I hope you're having a good day wherever you happen to be right now. This is Otaku Station, where today we'll be talking about episode three of Revolutionary Girl Utena. Now, you may remember uh, from last time the garden I planted. Well, some bad news there. Went down to check on it this morning, and the fence had been smashed down, like smooshed. Something big, and I mean big, got in there. So now I've got that to deal with. But in the meantime, I wanted to take a look at the animation itself in Utna. So uh, let's head down to the analysis room to look at that. All right, let's talk about the animation of Utna. I always love talking about animation itself. And there are five points I want to make about the animation here. The first is the use of high frame animation for repeated sequences. Um, you know, the ascension to the dueling arena, uh, as we see in episode two and in one, but with Sionji, the uh, pulling out of the sword from Anthe, and other sequences in here are used over and over in episodes of Utna. Now, this is not technically a magical girl show in the traditional sense, right? Um, Utna is not approached by some little animal companion that tells her she has to fight for humanity or whatever. Um, and she's certainly not a, you know, a, a, a young girl, although she seems to be in middle school. Weird. Anyway, um, point being, this is not a magical girl show, but the director, Ikuhara, worked on Sailor Moon just before this, so I'm sure he was pulling that technique forward from Sailor Moon and Magical Girl, saying, if we can come up with something that makes sense to show up every episode, we have these duels. Uh, if we animate that once and then use it over and over again, that's fewer minutes per episode that we have to animate. So while it does take time and effort to animate those like really well, uh, it kind of saves time and money in the long run. So a smart technique uh, to use there in this very non-traditional anime series. And we'll get to the non-traditionality of it in a minute. So again, high frame animation for these repeated magical girl-esque sequences. The second thing is the use of high frame animation for dramatic moments, not surprising, but not necessarily action sequences. There's this sequence from episode three where uh, Utna <clears throat> comes down to save Anthe. And there's quite a lot of animation here. You see her dropping down onto the ballroom. You see her grabbing the, the tablecloth and pulling it off the table and wrapping it around Anthe. Um, fairly high budget moment for something that, again, is not a duel. It's not something that you would traditionally think would need a lot of animation. You could very easily have had uh, Utna just, you know, reach for the cloth and then we, you know, get some, you know, uh, a... Uh, special effect sh uh, frame for a moment, and then we just see Anthe in the dress. Um, but animating all of that, in this case, I think, really calls into attention for the viewer how much Utna is a person with a bias for action, right? She sees a problem, she immediately tries to solve it. And that, I think, is highlighted by the high quality animation, the high budget animation. It draws your eye and draws you into that and makes you think, ah, movement, action, Utna, movement, action, right? The character is doing that. So uh, Ikuhara is not afraid to spend some budget on these moments that reveal uh, drama or melodrama uh, or personality from those characters. That's the second thing. Uh, third thing is the use of high qual quality, high frame animation for even comedic moments. You know, when Wakaba jumps on top of Utna, there's often quite a few frames of animation around that. Now, again, why would you do that? Well, I think it's because Utna has so much going on. <laughs> the show. Uh, you know, there's lots of melodrama and things you're trying to understand and strange secrets and mysteries that the, the uh, audience is trying to uh, understand and the characters are sometimes trying to understand. 
And so when we move to comedy, I think it's helpful to really put the comedy in your face, if you will, to make it very clear, okay, this is a comedic moment. We are kind of transitioning over. We can have a, a light moment in there. So that use of, uh, you know, higher frame rate animation and uh, these strong facial expressions, you know, very comedic facial expressions, really helps with that as well. So again, I think that, that works and, and helps. Um, so that's the third thing, these comedic moments use quite a lot of high frame animation. The fourth thing is the stylized movement and body poses of the characters in Utna. Uh, in this sequence in episode two, when you see this character descending, that's not a pose people are normally in in reality, right? It's uh, almost like a T-pose from uh, 3D CGI. Um, but you know, no one stands like this in, in reality, so why is that? And uh, they have to animate like this happening, the epaulettes and so forth. When he descends even further, uh, you see Utna and the, this character in this very unnatural pose, right? Look at the arch on Utna's back there. Um, no one outside of a contortionist can, can arch their back that much. And then the character above is in, again, this odd um, pose, almost like he's a puppet on a string, you know, that is hanging down. So uh, very uh, unusual uh, pose, which then I think helps to draw the viewer in. And then once Utna actually grabs the sword, you'll see she does this thing where she has this, um, you know, she, mm, or mm, mm, something that, like that, I guess, behind the sword, so something, something like that. Who does this, right? Who, <laughs> who, who has their hand like this behind a sword? But it draws your eye. It's a very visually arresting image. And this helps to get across, again, the, the uniqueness of the show. Makes it feel a little unreal, almost like it is a high art theater performance. You know, something uh, very unusual, very um, stylized, you know. So having these poses and this animation that's highly stylized, where characters aren't in standard poses, helps draw us into the world and make it seem like a very unusual world. Like this isn't just the normal world, it's maybe a, a different dimension, it almost feels like. And that's supported by the fifth thing I wanted to talk about, which is the character designs themselves. Look at how thin these arms are, look at how long the legs are. Very, very stylized, these, these long elongated necks. Um, Utna here is like 90% legs, pretty much. Uh, I'm, you know, overstating for effect, but this is not what you normally see for an anime character design, especially for a middle school girl. Why? Why would they do this? Because it makes the world feel unique and different. You're not in a regular, normal environment here. Things are a little off kilter. It's almost like a dream world where nothing is quite what it is in reality. Everything's a little bit off, so to speak. And uh, I think add that to the constant rose motif and the use of shadow puppets, and there's just a lot in here that combine to make Utna feel um, very unreal. And to be clear, the reason I brought this up in the animation analysis is that this is expensive. This is hard to do. This is time consuming to train a whole staff of animators on how to animate, draw these characters that are not the kind of designs they're used to, right? These proportions take a while to get used to drawing because you have to get used to, oh, the, her leg should be this long relative to her arms, to her chest, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it's hard. So this is part of bringing the audience into this almost dreamlike world of Utna. It's an important decision made in the animation. So that's that. Uh, that's what all I can think of in terms of the animation. Otherwise, let's be honest, it's pretty straightforward TV animation, right? Characters are walking. It's a walk cycle. Um, uh, you, you do see some interesting things in terms of how the camera is positioned, but that's really more about storyboarding uh, and direction rather than the actual animation itself. Um, otherwise, the animation is fairly workaday, at least at this point in the show. Uh, so nothing much more to comment on that there. So that's that.
Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. Uh, quick update. The tracks are, yeah, it's a red bear. Um, I'm going to have to reinforce the fence, but also track the bear down to see if I can figure out what attracted it to an empty garden. There is a rose bush on one side of the garden. Um, just been there forever, you know, uh, natural thing. Um, wonder if that could... Well, we'll have to see, but before I do that, let's talk about some anime. I'll get John and Steve on the line to analyze Utena episode three. It looks like we've got John and Steve on the line. How are things out there with you all? Everything good? Everything is good. The sirens are off, so that means everything is safe. Awesome. Yeah. Just replaced the guts of old Betsy out there, and uh, I think I can finally get the video screens back up. So nice, pretty good. Okay, look forward to seeing where that's that's going to go. Um, Hopefully so... to the store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> need some supplies there, huh? Out in the woods, you always need something. That's true. Um, well, I need an explanation of Utna, um, and I got one. Oh. So uh, I went back and I found that Utna was inspired by several things, uh, one of them being this novel called Damien by Herman Hess. And Damien's really interesting. So quick summary of, of Damien, the protagonist, it's about a, a boy to young man uh, chronicling the various things that happen to him that make him change from a child to an adult basically, how he becomes more mature. And in his early life, and to get you, give you an idea of how much this might connect to Utna, at one point he literally receives a message that tells him to break the world's egg. So yeah, wow. Wow. there, 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 there are connections go. here. Mm -hmm. um, so as a boy, he has this duality between uh, the world of light and the world of darkness, being good and being bad. And he contrasts the innocent child as living in the world of light and adults living in the, the dark world, uh, where they're constantly compromising, they're constantly um, messing up and, and doing bad things to each other, basically. Um, and that's his view. It's his very childish view when he's a child. As he grows up, he meets this young man named Damien, who has a much more seemingly evolved way of seeing the world, which the protagonist kind of can't quite connect with. The metaphor that, that Damien has is that, well, first he introduces this idea of uh, the chick in the egg is the child, right? Children live in this sort of self-contained world, this very simplified view of everything. And you need to do the hard work of breaking out of your, your shell into the more complex world of adulthood where you have a more complex, nuanced view of things that isn't so dualistic, right? Where good versus evil. Uh, the way they explain that in terms of the sort of Christian milieu they're in is that um, if God is the God of light and being good and all the good things you should do and Satan is the ruler of, um, of sexuality and um, all the things that are kind of... Um, pushed away from and kind of repressed by, by Christianity, all of those things are part of the human experience. And so there must be a spirituality that encompasses both. There must be a worldview that encompasses both. You have to be able to understand that these things all exist. And it doesn't mean that everything is equally worth doing. It just means that you, you stop thinking so dualistically of, I must do this, all those things are bad, and I, I, I avoid even thinking about them. Think more critically. Think bigger, mm. right? And it's this idea of, again, kind of breaking out of that kind of limited view of what correct action is um, as an adult. So, here's my theory on Utna. 
much like you can see Evangelion as Shinji's kind of fever dream <laughs> as he's trying to figure <laughs> things out, I think Utena can be interpreted as um, the viewpoints of a child trying to become an adult. So imagine there is a, say, middle school girl who's trying to decide what she should be like as an adult. Anthe and Utena represent two aspects of who she is and wants to be. Utena is the idealized mature self, right? Somebody who is compassionate, kind-hearted, but athletic, protective, all of these various positive attributes and really no negative attributes, right? That's, that's Utena. It's a, it's a very simplified view of maturity, right? There's no um, multidimensionality of it. Um, it's just somebody who is good, right? Anthe represents the child. Anthe is the version of yourself that is still a child, still innocent, still passive, still does whatever the adults tell you to do. Right? And thus, you have no responsibility for your actions. That's what Anthe is doing in the story. She represents somebody who is saying, I just do what people tell me to, and thus I just live my life that way. The, the, the life of the child, if you will. Utna is, here's who I think I want to be. The, the duels are against all the different dark adult perspectives and adult personalities in the world. So you could be like really in depth and say, maybe these are all characters the person knows or people the person knows and it's kind of bouncing off of them, those personalities. But you know, Sayonji is the is adult possessiveness, right? That evil. Utna has to fight that to show why she is better than that possessiveness. And each of the other members of the student council are other aspects, other dark aspects of adulthood that are being tested against this approach to the world. Right? So in this reading, Break the World Shell, Revolutionize the World is literally going from being a child to being an adult. It's saying, you know, how are you going to, you know, once you achieve the revolution, you are going to find your adult view of the world, your more mature perspective on the world. And Anthea and Utna both represent kind of the current ideas that are vying for control as you are approaching maturity. I don't want to say adulthood because it's you know, a long process, but that. Right. And if you see it through the, this, this lens, that is very much Anthony's role, is to be the quiet, submissive, quiet one who just submits to everything. Utna is this kind of weirdly idealized version of an adult. And then it's bouncing off all these other adult perspectives. Hmm. I'm not saying that hmm. is what Ikuhara intended. I'm not saying that is the only interpretation. But I think it helps make the storytelling make a little more sense. <laughs> well, I know we had talked about, Steve, I think you brought it up about the idea of like Sayonji is either lust or pride. Mm -hmm. Brand, you would also, also mention that as well. <clears throat> so you're saying it's even more nuanced than that. It's not just, oh, seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. That it is characteristics possessiveness um, uh, false faced mm -hmm. like things that aren't just seven deadly sins all those nice neat little things we can block off and say this is a whole right. encapsulated thing that it's more of these adult character traits that somebody approaching uh, adolescence from childhood confronts mm -hmm. confronts lying confronts yeah. cheating mm -hmm. confronts stealing things that are in a you know sort of normative child world black and white wrong and right mm -hmm. that it is this approaching 
the the gateway into experiencing things where there are gray areas. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's kind of interesting that we default to violence to deal with these things. Right. Because that, that is a very childlike, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm going to be the knight, the prince, the whatever, yeah. <clears throat> then that's how I'm going to deal with these problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, it is a fairy tale approach yeah. to solving problems. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's also, it's a stark realization. I, I, from personal experience, the first time that you're, you find out your parent lied to you mm-hmm. is a psychologically violent experience. Yeah. Because that's not you're, you're supposed to get absolute truth from a parent. You're not you're not they're not supposed to do that. You you know you're one of their own. So you you're on the inside of this. You should be lied to. Yeah. So I think that violent reaction is the psychology of the reaction to it, where it's like yeah. it's a shaping moment where it sort of snaps your, your little mm-hmm. your little idea of the perfect reality yeah yeah uh and i think as you get into it all these different enemies that you know, is, is are facing um can all be read as those different kind of traumas that you have as you are growing up and you're realizing oh this person is um self-centered right maybe they're not just lying but maybe they are just doing things for something that they think is the right thing to do but is actually hurtful you know this person is um um avoiding problems right um and that's a that's a bad thing for this reason and so you know so forth and so on how, how do we navigate that what, what is what is the right attitude to take towards each of those things Well, let's see if that holds up <laughs> um, as we dive into episode three of uh, Revolutionary dun, dun, Girl dun. Utena. Yeah, we haven't yeah. started the show. We've already exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think the, the if you stay on this image for a moment, doesn't that look like a rose? Oh, yeah, it does. Like the, the dueling arena? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. Especially like like petals fluttering off of it. Yeah. Interesting. Nope, I, 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 I keep Almost like off. the rose that Tuxedo Mask throws. No, mm. it, wrong story. <laughs> mm-hmm. To our earlier yep. point, if this is about <clears throat> which personality should survive, right, then this idea of Anthe and Uten uh, sort of dueling is appropriate for that metaphor. Another thing that I didn't realize until thinking more about this. So, Uten is a princess, right? Mm-hmm. This anime is set in, like, 1997 because Miki has a digital stopwatch. Mm. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, what kind of princess is Utena? Hmm. The best darn Uten one. Exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah. But it, an odd juxtaposition there. Remember, Utna herself says in episode one that she barely remembers the prince, right? Um, if that's true, what else does she not remember of this experience? Right. Right. Um, is this a partial memory of what happened back then? Presumably. Well, as I say, we know almost everybody in anime, if you're under 10 years old, you remember nothing about anything or anybody. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's this magical wall that just doesn't allow you to remember things. It's true. Well, you can't remember every slap that's been given to you. <laughs> <laughs> just the highlight reel, just not all. Mm-hmm. This is presumably that, that idea that, based on that childhood experience, this is now the... Um, personality she's trying to follow is that sort of fairy tale prince uh, archetype uh, not necessarily an, an individual she knows but this is how a prince should act so that's the personality I'm going to try to follow whether that's appropriate for her or not remember the giant dorm where the, they're the only two that live in it for no apparent yeah. reason <laughs> yeah. okay but you're not normal <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not not normal in any way, shape, or form. No. 
far too pretty. You are beautiful. The first rule of Rose Bride is to not talk about Rose Bride. Exactly. There you go. Mm hmm. Jeez. <laughs> little yeah, presumptuous little, of him. Little presumptuous, perhaps. Interesting, Anthony's reaction. She's shocked that U that Utna would react against that. Would like defend herself. Well, Anthony has uh, been very compliant with yeah. the demands made of her from student council. So this is probably the first time she's ever seen anybody stand up to anybody. Very true. Any more of a jerk? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what's interesting is that I assume that she knew that they had all the rings. Mm. Like they they, they yeah. had rings on them to, yeah. to, to be able to get into the dueling arena. Like that seemed to be like an obvious thing to know. Yeah. Yeah. And here she is going, oh, wait, she he has a ring? And I was I, a little, little surprised by that. Yeah, I'm assuming um, she she's only seen Toga once, and that's when he was confronting uh, Sayonji. Because um, she didn't, she, she would not have seen Toga during the duel. And so she probably didn't notice the ring on Toga's finger. She just saw that Sayonji had a ring. Oh, that's weird. Seeing it on Toga is like, oh, wait, you know, everyone has a ring, I guess. Yeah, because I think hmm. there was there was a point they had Sionji said something to her. It's like only those with the with the mm. symbol ring can duel. So she knew one person had it, but it's like I, I find it an interesting reaction on her part because she seems more shocked at his ring and more questioning than she was about Sionji having the ring. True. Right. You know, yeah. she didn't stop in her in her tracks, little yeah. sweat beads, going, "Why does Sionji have the ring?" Is he in love with the prince? You know what I mean? <laughs> no, it's only Toga that she's all like, oh my gosh, how did he get it? Like, it definitely seems like she's, her memory of her prince is triggering more directly with Toga yeah. as opposed to Seonji. Right. Seonji's like, no, like no possibility. But Toga's like, could he be the one? Maybe? Yeah, because Seonji was kind of an ass. So, yeah. <laughs> Even Not though the... there's a lot of, go ahead. Not the most princely of individuals. No. And, no. and Toga was, he's like a fist in a velvet glove. He's yeah. <laughs> sweetly, drippingly nice. Mm -hmm. Venomous intent, but yeah. yeah well, I can see that. in fairness, we don't know that. Like So far, right. Toga has, he 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 came in on, on in defense of Anthe. Um, he looked at Utna from afar, but he's also obviously in the student council. And he comes in, and, like, the hair thing is weird, but also he's clearly, like, a, a playboy kind of a archetype. Um, so that could be a thing that he just doesn't see as weird, you know, or right. doesn't see as hugely forward, maybe? It feels kind and of possessive, though. It does. But, well, you know, well, like, it's, Sionji's well, it's... possessive to Anthe. Mm -hmm. That running, having the largesse to run his fingers through her hair, mm -hmm. it's like... Yeah. You're kind of being possessive to Utna in a weird yeah. way. But I think he does know more... <clears throat> that, and and that he is. That we've established that he is more interested in her than probably yeah, the Rose Bride. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. He he doesn't seem particularly interested in Anthe, but he's yeah. definitely zeroed in on Utna. You're absolutely right. I don't know if I'll ever get used to the comedic tonal shifts in this show. <laughs> yeah. Again. Yep. Yep. Has to happen again. Uh, everybody's got to have their turn. Yeah. Apparently. Jesus. Run away. All right. Yeah. Run. 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 <laughs> run. Stuff and when she said dance queen, dance queen, of course I've got you know Abba. Yeah. <laughs> dancing, dancing queen. Well, yeah. Say, she Anthony's, seems trustworthy. Anthony's yeah, she's she's in trouble. I mean, this is. <laughs> I think she kind of realizes it because right before this look, mm. Anthony kind of is looking at her like a little like, huh? Like, uh oh. Let's see if it caught it. That. Yeah. Not like. Where oh, she's like, crap. I don't know what to make of this. I'm kind of mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, really? But also like, huh? Mm -hmm. this, this almost looks like, okay, so where's the slap from her going to come right. from? Right. <laughs> well, no, see, Anthony's such a great dancer. Everyone says her dance moves slap. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> 
boy. I'm assuming... Please the, say the, they're it, buttons. I, I, yeah, I think they are spare buttons for the dress. I, I, I think that's the intent. I hope so, because, yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what is going... What? Why so, is Choo Choo having, like, a breakdown? What's going on? I, I, I think that is a silica packet. Like a, a, a condensed oh. silica packet that he just ate. Uh, well, that's what those tablets <laughs> were. That must have been a yeah. That's what that's been what those were. Great. Okay. Great. Make, now Choo Choo's dying. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's actually okay. something we no. learn about Anthe finally. Thank yeah. you. Right. Mm -hmm. She has some kind of personality. Yeah. Anthe can't said... communicate. Sorry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there is an aspect of that in this. I I, mm -hmm. I do like that connection. And the very passive, if you say so. All right. <laughs> wow, Toka. Wow. Okay. That's All great, right. dude. Man. Being a member of the manga club really did a great job for Toka. <laughs> <laughs> what is the symbolism of the two dogs? Sionji and, and Toga? Maybe. Maybe, and you have Utna and Anthe dancing? Yeah. Unless Maybe. it's... If you go back. Um, unless the dogs are Utna and Anthe. You know, being led to something, you know. Hmm. Remember how you had said when we watched this last time that Anthe might have, like, other things kind of going on with her about mm -hmm. how this whole thing works? Mm-hmm. That was a very interesting comment. I'm sorry you embarrassed yourself for me. And it's like, wait a minute. On the one hand, that sounds kind of like, thank you for like doing me a solid and coming yeah. along. But it's like she very pointedly says, thank you for embarrassing yourself, basically. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> That's kind of a little bit of a backhanded kind of mm -hmm. comment there. Yeah. Like, uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's an odd thing to say. Yeah. Hmm. Fortunately, Nanami's here to make it all right. I'm oh, sure yeah. she will. Yeah, just like walking into a room full of poison snakes. I'm sure it makes <laughs> it all better. <laughs> You're touching her. Mm. Uh, uh, mm. Uh, 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 I feel like I need this shower. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, and it, it's you could tell Utna obviously has not had a lot of attention. Yeah. She has her dream prince in in uh, shining armor and on white horse and all that. Mm -hmm. She's obviously flattered. You don't yeah. get the little rouge on the cheek mm -hmm. without some kind of like, oh my goodness, he's really paying attention to me. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Anthe's smiling a bit here, so clearly appreciating the attention to some extent. Mm, yes. Oh, <laughs> that's just an evil scowl. Let's just be honest here. Where's Sailor Moon? Sailor Moon needs right. to be here right now yeah. with the tiara. Flame. Exactly. She's, she's going to just monster out. You hear the, the uh, celery cracking neck. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> what do you do, throw water on her or something? Or dump punch oh, all over her? Yeah, let's find out. I got to... Oh call out a what an effective visual but also yeah no computers right right like, yeah. this is a literal visual effect you had to apply onto this like well done um, however they manage this that's a good technical question how the hell did they do that yeah, i do not know um i'm assuming it is a like a a blur applied over a transparent cell um, and then move the cell slightly some, somehow yeah is it, well no they're st i was gonna say is it quartered because you can yeah, see no. she's standing in the middle of the quarter yeah where you could move each quarter I'm, but there's people standing on the quarter i'm actually i think this is a multi-plane camera so you have a blur mm. cell above that is clear in the center and you're zooming it in and out so that when it gets to some level, it's clear, but as it gets closer to the, the camera, so it starts close to the camera, it's blurred, you move it out and it becomes less blurred. Something along mm -hmm. those lines. Or, sorry, 
Um, it could also be they have two versions of the cell, um, of, of, of the drawing, and they are very slowly fading between the two. Mm. It's like one mm. blurred version, one non-blurred version. So it's just neat, the streaking kind of yeah. thing going on with it. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to wow. know how they do that. And these uncom- you know, being uncomfortable around people, and she's dead center of a ton yeah. of folks. Like, mm-hmm. ooh, panicky. Totally. Panicky anxiety time. Mm-hmm. Interesting also. Um, so an easy animation trick is to make your character a different color than the people around you. So famously at the mm-hmm. opening of um, Beauty and the Beast, Belle is the only character wearing a light blue, uh, white blue outfit. Um, everyone else is a different color. And so you can very clearly see who Belle is. They're not really doing that with Anthe here, though. Um, there are other girls with green dresses and so forth, which I think works well in this because, again, it makes Anthe feel more like um, uh, she's not special, right? She right. is like somebody, somebody else. She should be one of the onlookers as opposed to the central character. Dan, is actually, if you look at some of the crowd right at the bottom of the screen, you'll see mm-hmm. another girl, purple hair, green dress. Yeah, that's true. Green mm-hmm. dress, green dress, purple hair, mm-hmm. pink dress, purple, blue. So you have these yeah. same kind of colors going on. Yeah. Ugh. It's your brother, lady. What's oh, up with God. you? So why do we do this? So, so I'm just gonna say, um, we'll, we'll go back a little bit. Um, get the actual line there. Um, so those who say that the whole bro sis thing is recent. Haven't watched it enough. Yeah. Yeah. They're in middle school. That's a bottle of champagne? Mm-hmm. Huh. Okay. I should point out, um, Uten and Anthe are in middle school. Uh, the student council is presumably in the high school area. Okay. So they would be and it, potentially... And it could be just sparkling cider. That's true. Yes. That is very true. Um, also to that point, I... I don't know for a fact. I'm assuming this is a three-year middle school, three-year high school. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, and these are like last-year middle school. Anthony Newton are like last-year middle school students. So a little older than, you know, they're not 12, in other words. They're not in fifth grade. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I do kind have of a childish out, prank. Like, very childish yeah. prank. Also, the somewhat obvious physical sexual metaphor here like let's put that on the table right oh you know. okay um yeah. oh look look at that someone actually said no to you yeah, yeah. i've never checked it what just calling that out he is clearly surprised that she is refusing to go along with this hmm. yeah notice toga's reaction here um he doesn't approve of what nanami is doing which is good but also the reaction is oh this screwed thing up things up for me yeah. No concern for Anthe, just ah, bad timing. I was about to get her just where I wanted mm-hmm. her, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's in full dueling outfit. She is. This is not mm-hmm. her regular just suit jacket and thing. She's got the little nope. skirt going on, the epaulets, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I thought Appar- you only got that during transformation. Yeah, a- a- apparently she decided to bring that with her or something? I don't know. Oh, what the uh-huh. hell? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're a prince and apparently a seamstress. Um, yeah, seamstress. apparently, yes. Um, all right, a few things to note here. Again, a very childish imagined solution to a problem. You know, yeah. it's very, very simplistic. It's tablecloth. Yeah. Right, how, how do I solve this? Also, you see the white rose. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, white rose in Japanese flower language is for like a pure, innocent love. Yeah. So that's the relationship Im- implying here. As opposed to the red rose that Udna was wearing in her hair from Toga. Right. Which, which is, is the rose of passion. Love. Yes. Yeah. I should also say, I'm, I'm, I'm a little unclear on that because later on, they seem to use those roses specifically also for character so you can see toga it's a red rose because his hair is red not a yellow rose because her hair is yellow so also yellow rose is jealousy and not has jealousy issues so i don't know if 
the hair colors mm. like literally are the, mm. the that or sometimes the roses just mean you know toga is talking or nanami is talking i'm not sure mm. i thought yellow rose was friendship it could be but also uh, jealousy check. okay i didn't realize that um uh I will I will double check on that. Uh Hana ko, Hana Hana Kotoba. Um let me let me check here real quick because that is important to to be sure of. Uh well, yellow... have, how how many times have we seen things like morning glories, ginkgo, blah blah blah. So according to Wikipedia it's jealousy. Ah we'll, we'll see. So... Yeah, you got the wrong girl there. Exactly. Little, little yep. chickadee. Mm-hmm. Toga's got a pretty nice house. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the governor's palace at Williamsburg. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> nice house. Yeah, somebody's got a little money. thought for a second Toga was going to say something like, yes, she's fascinating. She'll be my bride. Mm -hmm. Like, oh. Mm -hmm. My rose. I have to get her into my... Uh, what was it dating club? What was it? Or on high school? <laughs> host club. <laughs> host club. <laughs> host club. Yes. I thought you were gonna say dungeon, Steve. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> you know. Um... Well, that's Sanji. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The other thing is, like, around high school host club, like those characters are very much Utna characters in a you know in a yeah. basic yeah. way. So that's episode Jeez. three. Wow. Yeah. Um, hmm. So no well, duel this we... time. No duel. We have a, a very much a stylized uh, envision of oneself being the the <clears throat> prince and being <clears throat> suddenly magically changing from a dress mm -hmm. with no shoulders to a you know dueling costume. And it was under the dress. You just couldn't say yeah, yeah, definitely, it definitely. And then being able to with one hand, I I gotta tell you to use that cloth as as a as a um, yeah dress. Or, and do the rose thing. That that's very very nice. Pretty impressive. Well, she and, did work at a quality inn, so she could do the roses. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. So. That's true. Um, but what I thought was actually really interesting was how long the dance went on for. True. Yes. Right. And and you know we had repeats of images, but you know usually when we see something like that, it's like okay, here's about here's your five second thing, and it's done. It's over. And we move mm -hmm. on. But whatever. This was clearly trying to establish a hey we're no longer just miss utna right mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're going into a different trajectory here mm -hmm. yeah um i'll also call out it's possible they were slightly short this episode um, right because they had to pad the ending by a little bit but to your point i completely agree like i think this is and especially given the variety of shots even though they do repeat indicates that they are very much pointing out that this is this dance is changing the tenor of their relationship yes because yeah. anthe certainly there's a you know good shots of anthe looking up to Utna. she's smiling at Utna, mm -hmm. and it's like it's not it doesn't feel like the submissive element that she often has with mm -hmm. her sort of smiling whatever you want mm -hmm. this is kind of like a oh my kind of look and we didn't get a duel because we got a new character. True. So Nanami and her little clique is mm -hmm. the new character element, so it removed dueling. Indeed, so, in a sense, this kind of was a duel, just with Nanami in a... In a um, duel party. of wits. Right, yeah, a dueling of wits and of, like, political acumen, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, which Utna managed to defeat. Yeah. Which All is interesting for the, love for the of brother. For the, <laughs> for the preview, they talk about, oh, Mickey, you know, he plays the mm -hmm. piano and he's he duels at a national level or he fences at a national level. Yeah. Oh, Mickey, was Sionji so that so good? Ah, mm hmm. You know what I mean? Because Sionji right. is the holder of the Rose Bride. Mm -hmm. We don't really have a lot of background detail. Did it? Does nobody else challenge Sionji? Utna is the only one that has ever tried to be the master of the Rose Bride. Mm. Toga didn't? I would have thought Toga mm. would have been like, oh, no, 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 I deserve the Rose Bride. Right. So this, these are interesting things. I'll, I'm interested to see how, how that develops. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, like, what's been the trajectory of, like, was Sionji the first duelist, as far as we know? Right. 
we, we, we have no idea of that. True. Because um, the end of the world determined that it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a specific person. It just must be the student council that brings about the revolution. True. So that does oh, Sionji yeah. have the Rose Bride and who cares if it's him or anybody else as long as it's the student mm. council. Right. Yeah. What does the end of the world, what does the revolution mean? You know, right. what does that accomplish? Does it matter who does it? Right. Hmm. Hard to say at this point. Um, why does end of the world want a world revolution? What, 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 is, what is end of the world's goal? Unless it's the end of a childhood, and that's the end perhaps, of the world. Perhaps. That, that, is, that is what uh, Demian would say. Yeah. Like cracking that shell. Once yeah. you, you know, the end of the world is the end of your little childhood fantasies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your Chunibyo syndrome is yes. gone. Wiped away. <laughs> um, and to that point, I think this is very much um, that idea of the... Man, it just does not want to show that moment. Um, uh, right, come on. There we go. Um, let's get a slightly better view. There we go. Um, this feels like, again, a child imagining being humiliated and then somebody just sweeping her off her feet to solve it. Utna truly is her shining prince on a white horse. Exactly, yes. Utna is being, being a prince. Um, what does that Which mean? I'm assuming that's why she has the like dueling arena outfit on, mm -hmm. is that she's inhabiting that prince role yeah. more fully, rather than just her school uniform. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and even Utna points out that the, the, the wearing the boy's school uniform is more a, a habit or desire of her, it's not a statement about her that she wants to be a boy or that she wants to, right. you know, um, uh, do the things boys do specifically. Right. Um, so this is much more the explicit prince uh, aspect of her. Yeah. Yeah. Because we had in this episode her saying, I just want to meet a normal boy. Yeah. So it's like she doesn't want to be a boy. She mm -hmm. is just stating that, you know, she's for all intents and purposes, a normal girl like anybody else. Right. Um, but for being a prince. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a, a, a normal girl who wants the princely qualities. Right. To fulfill that role. Do you, do you think it's a control issue? <clears throat> oh, she's how so? In a dress and, and she's in a dress, and she doesn't feel comfortable. Mm. Um, Tonga comes up to her, and she doesn't really know how to react, and she lets him get in close, yeah. and she lets him put his paws on her basically you know just mm -hmm. kind of hold her to him and then when you know the thing happens mm -hmm. she's kind of broken out of that spell and then she's just like okay well i'm gonna do the thing that i know how to do which yeah. is to act like a prince and then she but she doesn't just put on the prince outfit she mm -hmm. puts on the dueling because she's just been not manhandled but she's been yeah. basically touched by this guy and she's not sure she likes that so maybe she was ready for a fight that's a good point uh you can certainly see that she's struggling with herself early in the scene that she you know, into our earlier point in the in the earlier scene she kind of liked the attention or she yeah. really didn't mind the attention um and so she's you know here a little uncertain as to what what this all means for her And then I, I do like that interpretation that she's suddenly like, oh, now I can get rid of this uncertainty with the certainty of action. Right. Mm. Yeah. Well, she was being in that situation with uh, Toga. With she, with Toga, she was being acted upon. Yeah. So she is uncomfortable and uncertain and is being acted upon by an exterior Look, force I'm... attempting to direct her and to to mm -hmm. channel her in a in a particular way yeah and she then sort of snaps to it and realizes that her 
positive action is a way to take that control, as Steve mm -hmm. was saying. Take control of this situation like she envisions should be done. Mm -hmm. So she goes from being acted upon to acting as a forward moving actor. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. Interesting. The other question, too, kind of is um, what is Natomi trying to accomplish here? <laughs> right? Like, she embarrasses, you know, the, the intent is to embarrass Anthe. Fine. Okay. Um, but also, her brother wants, she thinks, her brother's interested in Anthe. So she's embarrassing the girl that her brother's interested in. Like, that seems self-destructive. Well, you'd think that, you know, if uh, he was going to be a prince himself, he would jump down. Right. And so, right. help Anthe, and that that would deepen their relationship, in which case, Nanami wouldn't, you know, you, you're giving him the keys to, to winning Anthe versus yeah. doing something like showing that something about Anthe is repulsive, that she's mm. a liar, or, you know, set her up, that she stole your makeup bag and make her look mm. like a thief. You know, these are kind of classic things that happen in shows now. Yeah. And it's like, I have no idea how Nanami was going to win this situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if she's really into her brother, wants her brother's attention, and she figures that if they're both of high society, an embarrassment like this would turn him off from her and Fair. go, "Oh, I can't be, I can't be yeah. with someone who's going to be like this, mm -hmm. who's dis who's been disgraced, right?" Yeah. And <clears throat> and and but also at the same time, what happens to people who are jealous? They grow blind, mm -hmm. and they don't. So she may not even see to. John, to your point, she may not even notice or think that that could be a reaction of her brother, which would be True. to actually be the good guy and to jump down and save yeah. Anthony, which would have been a really interesting yeah. thing to happen if, if he had actually done that. But um, <clears throat> since they're so, both of them are so self-absorbed in their own ways, yeah. she probably can't see that, and this is and this is her her, her way of deflecting attention back to, yeah. to herself somehow. And adding on to that, if he is a playboy and she knows that, perhaps she's counting on the idea that any excuse will divert his attention away from Anthe. So something this trivial would be enough to make him go on to the next girl. Um, mm, right. You know, sure. even if that's a, you know, even if she's wrong, that might be the impression she's got. Interesting. If I can only make Anthe look terrible, then he'll just move on to that girl over there, who I'll also ruin. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Until there are no more women left. But <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Uh, um, uh. Also, you know, I'm going to strip this girl topless in front of a guy, so he won't be interested in her in her anymore. Let me tell you something, not me. That that's not how that works. <laughs> Again, this is the journey in uh, from childhood to adolescence to maturity. <laughs> yeah. The the child would say throwing a mud pie in your face mm -hmm. is you know or th splashing yeah. water on somebody. Ah, mm -hmm. take that, you! I don't like you. Mm -hmm. But to your point, it's like you've now exposed a part that becomes more interesting as males <laughs> age, yeah. and uh, that really could uh, could have gone poorly. It, it could have. Been like, oh, hey, how you doing, <laughs> Anthony? What's up with you? I see you're uh, feeling a little extremist, are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Scintillating or titillating, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just mm -hmm. edit that part out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, no, I mean, you, you, to our earlier point, you know, you add this to the the white liquid sprayed all over Anthony. It's like, hmm. Yeah. Just, just. Mm. The not so subtle. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> like, oh, the, 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 there's various visual metaphors at play here that do mm -hmm. suggest, you know, that there's a. And it's one of the things I like about this is that I think what Ikohara is doing here, or whoever storyboarded the the the, the scene or wrote the scene, um, it's kind of that what they're talking about with the the sort of sublimated sexuality that anime often gets a, 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 a away with, where they're not saying this is a sexual scene. But they are using some of those metaphors to get across. That's kind of some of the, the 
implications of what's going on. That's the what the characters are dealing with, you know, mentally in this situation right. are, are questions of adulthood, of maturation, of how I'm physically appealing to other people, that kind of stuff. You know, there's 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 sexual tension in this scene, right? Yes. Uh, underlying everything going on. Um, especially with not, not a meaner brother, apparently. <laughs> so, so I would just have to say yeah. that if I were Anthony, and this were like real life school, mm -hmm. I would probably transfer from the school because I'd be like, okay, none of you all offered me a jacket. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> none of you. Yeah. You just stood, stood there and gawked. Mm -hmm. Well, it does reinforce what we've been hearing in this episode, mm -hmm. where Utna keeps saying, don't you have any friends? Don't you have anybody yeah. that you hang out with? And it's like, not only does this scene serve the, the primary purpose that you're seeing, but it also is the secondary purpose that she doesn't have a single person that is willing to do that, Yeah. to throw a jacket, to go and get mm -hmm. a tablecloth. To run in and be like, oh my goodness, one of the girls with the big skirts, you know, kind of just, come on, honey, let's get out of here. Yeah. It's like, she has not a friend in the world, apparently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, in fairness, you know, there are people like this. Oh, yeah. You know? Um, uh, it's, it's not wholly unrealistic, sadly. So, the, the to your point, the what they're kind of getting across here is, that, you know, there are downsides to being that reserved and that shut off from, from the world. Yeah. Um, you, you might need to break your shell. Dun, dun, dun. Well, hence my reference to a bucket of pig's blood from Carrie, mm. who also really didn't have any friends, and she broke the world shell. Yeah. In a supernatural <laughs> she way. She <laughs> killed a whole bunch of people. And just, well, you know. Yeah. Uh, omelets. You can't make yeah. an omelet. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I'm <Just, I'll> breaking <laughs> a few <laughs> eggs. Anthony goes elf and lead. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you may call me Lucy. Oh, Lord. Here yeah. we go. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't get that bad. No. But yeah. Uh, interesting episode. And again, kind of structurally, the fact that there's. You'd expect, okay, episode three, time for another duel, time for another thing, but it's much more of this. Uh, social encounter yep. uh, introducing Nanami and what's what's going on with her which seems to be a lot would you consider it world building or or yeah because there's not much of the world that we get, we're seeing <laughs> in this. Mm -hmm. their social world we're starting to understand a little bit better mm -hmm. so I guess yeah um, we, we're certainly learning more about Toga and his yeah. reputation we're learning more about Nanami and her feelings. Um, yeah. And, but then also how quickly... Like, we also noticed how Nanami came across those three girls and they like immediately became her minions. Yeah. So yeah. clearly there's a lot of social pull that Nanami has and thus presumably Toga has uh, with their absurdly wealthy household. And this still image... Is his one shoulder just longer than the other? <laughs> it does look like it, yeah. <laughs> it does, yeah. A little bit. Like, what's uh, going on there? <laughs> so, Utna does have a disadvantage, and, and this is a, a fair point. These character designs are so unusual. Often, when you pause Utna, you'll just go like... <laughs> <laughs> what is happening just, here? Mm, something's a little off about that, that drawing. Um, is, and again, not a complaint. AI is... not being able to get the Android. <laughs> <laughs> How many fingers does he have? Um, but no, it, it, yeah, there are definitely moments <laughs> where it's like the animators are struggling with these designs. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on this episode of Utna? Having seen all of it, Brent, does Choo Choo always stay around? Is this just a thing yes. we don't get rid of? Yeah. Damn it. Um, Choo Choo is a is pure unadulterated comic relief it, it is there to be a a thing that you chuckle at in the various episodes all the way through to the very end okay, um, wow. I don't yeah. know if Choo Choo is in the final episode because it, yeah, it's very dramatic and so forth um, the isekai but... truck comes and takes them away <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> oh, oh, God, what? <laughs> things happen in that final episode. Um, but yeah, um, it, it is very... And like, like, then there are even like scenes, like very dramatic scenes later on where Choo Choo is in there and it's clearly just to add some levity to, to the moment. Right. I feel like this episode is the first episode where we get a normal sense of the world. Oh, interesting point. That they're, that, that they're in right now. So yeah. instead of the, the dueling and doing the thing, having the weird funeral dirge, heavy <laughs> metal thing going on, and having the duel and stuff, this feels like they're in the world. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and that this is how that, that part of the world operates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a recognizable party. Yeah, I hear that. Yep. Um, it's kind of a relief to realize it's not just going to be uh, standoffs between Utna and <laughs> the student council for 24 minutes yeah. every episode. Yeah. Because <laughs> I can only just see like them s swinging blades around in this party and like <laughs> just just descending into chaos and madness and like. <laughs> spurts of blood and like a limb going here, a limb going there. Uh, what was the um, uh, uh, the Monty Python sketch? Um, Sam Peckinpah's Afternoon Days whatever it was. <laughs> uh, Sam Peckinpah's Garden Party. Um, <laughs> uh, it's just, a, you know, a, like an 18th century garden or 19th century garden party and then suddenly somebody pulls out a blade and it's just blood spurting everywhere and, you know, <laughs> limbs flying off and all that stuff. Damn, I don't remember seeing that one. I'll have to, I'll have to find it somewhere. But yeah, um, yeah, very interesting episode. As is, classic of Utena. Definitely a, a remarkable, unusual experience. Yeah, and we'll get back to the the weekly duels at another time. Apparently, <laughs> yes. Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. Uh, good news. I tracked down the bear. Is that good news? I don't. I don't know. Um, turns out it was it was nesting in a little hollow, uh, not far from the tower. Again, fortunately, I don't know. At least it's I found it. Uh, weirdly, there was indeed like a rose on it. Like apparently, it had attacked the rose bush. Maybe something about the rose got it riled up. I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, while we, while I was watching it, it watched me. It saw me and got riled up again. Uh, fortunately, I had my walking stick, so I was able to sort of trade blows with it for a while. Duel, if you will. And uh, eventually got in a good thrust, and that seemed to be uh, enough for it. So it ran off, uh, and I... Don't think I'll have to worry about it again. I hope. Sometimes you just have to stand up for yourself. Well, that'll do it for today. Thanks for watching. Until next time, watch more anime.